Let me start out by saying that uh, my family were farmers before we got in the barbecue business. My father had a passion for cooking barbecue, and that's how we ended up in the barbecue business. When the farming got to the point he couldn't make a good living and he turned his hobby into a business, thank goodness. And it's just been very successful for us. We uh, opened up our first little barbecue place uh, in 1956 on Highway 25 in an old uh, open air curb market, which was kind of like a 7-Eleven today, I guess you would say. Just a little hole in the wall, but you find 99% of your better barbecue comes out of a hole in the wall, not a really, really fancy building or a, uh, a show place or anything. You better barbecue comes out of something that you, you see a lot of time old service station converted and what have you, or stands by the road, just any kind of thing like that, they turn it into a little barbecue place. Well, we stayed in that little hole in the wall from 1950, and we re remodeled it a couple of times to kind of add some things to it. We put some slabs on the outside to give it the illusion of being a little semi log cabin and some brick on it to, you know, kind of change the core up a little bit, did some work to the inside, went from dirt floors to cement floors. And, uh, and then in, in 1969, we had a fire and burned our pits up. Uh, before the, uh, before the, and why, I don't know this, but every barbecue pit I ever went into before we built the kind we have today, you walked into the barbecue pit, it had a roof like this, and then it had on top of that little roof, it had another little roof, and I'm sure you've seen them. Well, for some reason, and I'm not the tallest guy in the world, those little buildings were about this tall. That was it. A tall guy had to stoop to get in one of those buildings. Well, occasionally you'd have a little grease fire. That just, that's all part of the barbecue business. Well, one time that grease fire got a little out of hand and it got up in the ceiling and burned the building up. So we had to start all over. Well, my father couldn't renegotiate a lease with the gentleman he was re leasing the building from. So we took uh, a chance, and he had some property up on the corner of Windsor Spring and 25. And he went up there and, and put up a little temporary building. It, it ended up staying there from uh, 69 to 78. Uh, and we operated out of that. Uh, it's right ironic when we moved up there, I mean, we would, nobody was out there. And then in 78, Bobby Jones Highway came through, which all of a sudden turned it into a, you know, a, great, great corner for business. Well, all of a sudden, you're sitting on our front porch, looking in the back of a, on one side, you're looking in the back of an automobile dealership. On the other side, you're looking at, at a Burger King. And we kind of lost our identity. So we decided to, to expand our business. So we moved from the, this little building to the little Quonset type hut. We built our original log cabinet we have today back in 1978. We opened it up in 78 and we stayed there roughly 10 years. And then in 1988, we actually picked the cabin itself up, moved it up the hill about a fourth of a mile, maybe a little more, relocated it, and it gave us our own individuality again. Then when you, when you, when you get up there now, it almost looks like you're going into like a little mountain area or, or something else. It's not like you know, it's not like just your normal restaurant. You know, everybody's got a restaurant that's jammed up to somebody else. The whole idea behind what we tried to create was we want you to feel like you're going home to, to grandmother's or going home to mother's house, not just going to another restaurant. We want to give you an experience, not just, you know, not just a, uh, another place to eat. And our, our ladies that uh, wait the tables, for instance, wear long dresses. The whole idea behind that is to take you back in time when things were laid back and it wasn't so rushed and you know just going wide open all the time. When you come into our restaurant, you walk over, uh, you walk up a across a bridge or a little creek. The whole idea there again behind that, you know, water is relaxing. So we try to just, just put it all in one and give you just a great experience. I was telling somebody the other day that my desire was to make sure that, that we wanted to make Sconyers to our area what the Dillard House is to the mountain area, a place that you want to go to and a place you will remember. And we have been, been very, very blessed. We've had international people come in and visit with us. We've had the opportunity to serve the White House. Uh, as a matter of fact, my mom and I danced on the White House lawn in 1980. It was just, it was just a wonderful treat. 
we, we, we've been fortunate enough to put our barbecue on Air Force One, feed some presidents. Uh, we, we just had a great experience, but it all goes back to one thing, what my parents instilled in me when I was a young man. We're going to do this, we're going to do it right, and the, the, we're going to keep it consistent. It's got to be the same. If it's bad, it's got to be bad every time we come in there. They won't know the difference. It can't be bad one time, good the next time. So we try to do that, and I've got a staff that's just second to none. Uh, the, the guy that runs my pit operation, David Brown, has been with me 45 years. You know, he and I almost grew up together in the pit down there, learning how to cook the barbecue. We cook our barbecue at, at least 24 hours, low and slow. You know, you don't rush it. You don't rush it. We tried to sell some franchise. They kept bawling me about, man, we want to buy a franchise. So we sold two. Ended up taking two back because they didn't want to spend the time doing what we do. So the, the whole idea with what we do is we want to give you a great experience, but we want to give you great food. You know, a lot of people can go out and cook barbecue, but there's a difference between barbecue and then real southern barbecue. What we do is a real McCoy. It's cooked with live coals, you know, nothing artificial. We don't, we use the best, I was reading an article the other day and the guy said, well, you know, you can take a second grade cut of meat and barbecue it and make something really good out of it. I thought to myself, well, what's wrong with taking a great piece of meat and making something better out of it? And so that's what we do. We, we buy the best meat money can buy. We don't cut a corner. We're not gonna do that because when I go out to eat, I, I like to get a, a, a great meal at a fair price and great service. And that's the one thing that we try to do at our restaurant. We give you the very best you can get. The wait staff is, is just, all of them been with me a long time. I've got wait staff, this is unheard of in the restaurant business, 42 years. They've been with us that long. The one thing we learned a long time ago was you take care of the staff, the staff take care of you. So there again, it's been, it's, it's been a, a great ride for all of us. We've, we've all just about grown up together in the barbecue business. You know? That's all I've ever done all my life, and, and I love what I do. We, uh, we take a lot of pride in it. The, the, the whole staff is like that. There's, there's nothing negative that's gone. You. Everybody's going to go out of their way to make you have a great experience. And people call us and tell us all the time what a good time they had. And I often remember what my daddy told me. He said, son, remember this. They'll have a thousand good meals, and they might compliment you. They'll have one, and they're gonna complain. That's what my dad and mom always taught me that, that you know they they they'll eat a thousand meals there, and they might compliment you, but they get that one bad meal, that's when they're gonna complain. So our theory is, if you got a problem, you call me. We're gonna take care of it. You know that's another thing they taught me. You can. You can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar, so we'll nice them to death, and we believe in that. And that's been one of our philosophies the whole time we've been in business. If you got a problem, we're going to correct the problem. And I'd rather you call me and tell me about the problem so I can correct it than to go out there and tell somebody else. You're helping me. You're not hurting me. You're helping me. So and that's, that's the way we run our business the whole time, and it's been really successful for us. We had a, before all this, pandemic, we had a successful catering business that, that we've done since 1980, and, and it's been really great because this uh, virus has kind of put a stop on everything. The, uh, I, I don't know what the effect's going to be from the, for the, what are they calling it, the uh, the old new or the new old, what it's going to be. We, you know, we don't know how the restaurant's going to look. We've, we've eliminated about half the seats in our restaurant. Uh, Thank goodness we were very fortunate to have a drive through that kept us going during the you know during the last two and a half months. Had not it been for the drive we'd had to close our bit you know our restaurant up. I was able to keep all my employees employed except just a few of them because uh, the wait staff we didn't have a, a spot to put them we you know we got them paid so they were taken care of but it uh, that drive through just just amazed me it, it all picked up from where the restaurant stopped and almost kept us at the level we were before the, you know, before we had to shut the, the uh, dining rooms themselves down. And it's, it's going to be uh, quite exciting when we open up on the 4th and see what happens and see how the patrons take it. Because as you walk in one of my dining rooms now, there's a big hole in this, I mean, not a hole, but as a, the center is just, uh, the way our dining rooms are located, the center 
is just kind of open because we had to stack them around the walls to be able to get the six foot separation that they're asking for. But we've been able to do that successfully and get everything else going. Uh, uh, the supplies have worked with us great. We had a little problem getting meat one time, but we had to send all over the country to get meats. But there again, by using the supply chain, that, uh, the supply chain that we use, we were able to bring everything in, so we didn't miss a you know didn't miss a day having the food we needed, which which there again by having a good relationship with those supplies that we have over a period of time that, you know that, that we built up, we were able to keep everything coming in steady like it should, which made a big difference. A lot of my friends were unable to get food, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, we just been blessed so so many 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 ways. We really have. When we first started out, we used. The briquettes, like everybody else used back then, which was just uh, it's charcoal that is uh, ground up. It's actually the findings off of the lump charcoal. They grind it up, they mix it with cornstarch, compress it, and that's where your briquettes came from. Well, that's what what everybody used. And uh, over the years, we found the lump charcoal, which is just chunks of wood. And we used to actually go to uh, Steelville, Missouri, and, and we up bought, bought, bought our own truck just to do that to haul the charcoal back here. And it's uh, oak and hickory slabs, uh, 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 chunks, not slabs, but oak and hickory chunks. We did that for 30 years, and, <laughs> and then Royal Oak went out there and bought the plant, raised the price of the charcoal, and cut the quality of the charcoal. So we started searching, and now we use mesquite. We used oak and hickory for about 40 years. We've been in business 64 years. I'm very proud of that. That's, that's a long time for the same family to stay in, in, in one business. We hope we can, I'd like to see it make a hundred. I, I really would. I, I probably won't be here, but, but it'd be nice if I could, you know, but, but I hope my wife and son and those will be here to enjoy the, the hundredth anniversary of it. That, that, you, that, that was my desire to make it last. You know. When my father died in 1973, the, the first thing I remember was we had a sales rep that about six months before my dad passed away came in and he, he made a statement to me. He said, you know, Larry, you and your daddy work pretty good together. He said, but do you realize that 95% of fathers and sons that are in business together, when the father dies, the son will lose the business in six months to a year. That one thing stood out in my mind when my father passed away, and I thought, I'm not going to let my daddy down. I'm going to show him we can do this. And that's when I really went to work and started pushing that thing. And that's why we were able to make the growth we've made. Uh, kind of got off the subject there a little bit, I'm sorry. We uh, were going to talk about why we cook the barbecue low and slow. The whole idea, first of all, let's, let's say this, fat means flavor. If you don't have fat in a piece of meat, you're not going to have any flavor. So, now, the meat comes in and it has a little fat on it. The whole idea was the low and slow, and, and we have our own patented pits that we developed about 40 years ago. And I wish I had a picture I could show you. They are so simple now to us. They, they probably wouldn't be simple to, to the general public, but we developed these things, and, and you put the meat in there, get the fire right, cover it up, and it cooks itself. You don't have to. When I was a young man working on that, we turned the meat every two hours. I mean, we, we work hard at it. Well, we finally figured out that if you leave it alone, it cooks itself, and you don't have to do all of that. And it doesn't tear the meat all up, because every time you turn it, you know, you tear the meat up or loosen it. We don't do that now. We developed a spike system. We cook hams and Boston butts. We used to cook the whole pig years ago. That was the thing. Everybody had a whole pig. That's what we cooked. Like everybody else. Make a hog head hash. Like everybody else. Well, the, the pigs were, were always a little fat. We even took and put the meat in a big collar and strained it to get the grease out. Well, we learned that if you, if you cook it low and slow, and we put it on these spikes that we developed in, in our patented system, every bit of that grease will drain out of there. And what you end up with is a nice, moist piece of meat without the fat. The, the, the flavor's there, but the fat's gone. And then, of course, we, now we're able to sell the fat, stuff we didn't do, do before. You know, all these little things, you, we made a lot of mistakes, but we learned from every one of those mistakes. And some of those uh, mistakes we made turned out to be very profitable for us because it taught us things we didn't know. Our pits are what we call indirect heat. We have a firebox. If this was the pit, 
we have a firebox here and a firebox on this side. So basically you got a fire on either side, the meat sits in the middle. We have a drip pan in the center. So as the fires get hot and, and then we put a but when I when I went to get our patent, it amazed me that the uh, patent attorney said the gases from the fire cook the meat. I thought, the gases. But that's what they call it. But it's the heat, they call it heat gas. Anyway, he said, <laughs> that's what cooks the meat. We got a big chuckle out of that. But anyway, he was right, I guess. But we use these dome type lids over it, and it rotates the heat in and it, it it just I want you to come out sometime, and I love, I love to take people on a tour of my pit so they can see what you're actually eating. And I'm very proud of doing that because most of the barbecue pits you go into are greasy, dirty. I had one of those, I know how it is. But in our facility today, it's not like that. I mean, my sales reps tell me all the time, you would not believe some of the kitchens we go in. We love to come to your kitchen because it's clean. We, we wash our kitchens down four or five times a day. I mean, but when we built this last building, we had, this is our full structure we're in now. It has three stores, it's about 16,000 square feet, I believe it is. The, we built it out of poured concrete with uh, epoxy paints on the wall. They, those guys take steamers and go in and steam that thing down. I mean, it's just so easy to clean. It drains everywhere. And it just, every time we moved, we, we learned something and made it better in the next facility. So we, uh, we even have an elevator in our building so that nobody has to pick up anything. Everything's on rollers, like the guys that have to take the garbage out. They put it on the elevator, roll it down, roll it out. The dumpster is recessed. All it is rolled over until it's open, pull it in. Nobody has to pick it up, nobody gets a strain. You know, just, we, we tried to simplify it, but make it the best it could be. And that has worked really, really, really good for us. You're right at 20 minutes. Okay, okay, good. Did I cover the slow cooking okay? Or yeah. Do we need to do anything else on that? Or? No, that was really interesting. Oh, good, good, yeah. good. You know, Can I ask a question too? Uh, please do. I, that would help me. You help. You, you know, you grew up in an era. Growing up on the farm, I'm always interested about that. Yeah. What was life like growing up on the farm as a kid? And your parents working on? I mean, that always is interesting to me. Oh, yeah. that's a world. There's not a lot of family farms out there anymore. No, I don't know. You know, no. and that was part of your childhood. Absolutely. Yes, we had a we had a, a farm, and it was kind of a uh, you know, Dad had row crops. We had cotton, corn, peanuts, you know, everything that the, uh, the normal farm had. Plus we had a dairy, I had to milk cows twice a day. A cow never takes a vacation. So one thing my dad instilled in me was hard work. And I've, I've never forgotten that. I just, that, that's all I know. My wife fussed at me all the time. You work too much, but that's all, that's the way I was brought up. I, that's the only thing, farmers do that. You know, I was watching a program this morning that said, we don't farm by the hour, we, farm, we don't work by the hour, we work by the acre. And that's exactly right. That's what they do. And, and but it, it's a great life. I mean, it's just that uh, you get to learn so many different things from nature. You know, watching things grow, watching the animals. Uh, we had pigs. You know, uh, I mean, he had pigs, chickens, cows. We had, we had it was just a, a diversified farm, so we always had something coming in. But if you just depend on the row crops, and if you have a bad season, then you got a problem. So he, we were diversified enough uh, that he pretty much had something coming in all the time, thank goodness. The, the dairy, I, that was not really one of my favorite things, but at least we had automatic milk because it wasn't so bad. And we had to get up at, before I went to school every morning, I had to milk cow and then had to come home and milk them in the afternoon. Because the cow doesn't take a vacation, that's twice a day, every day. But then, you know, but I guess I didn't really appreciate it as much back then as I do today. But it was really a wonderful life. It really, really was. So, hey. That's great. You know, that is, that's a different time period. That was a different era. You know, and, oh, absolutely. Like absolutely. You say, it doesn't matter if Saturday night you stayed up late. You still got to be up early to do chores. You, the next yeah. morning. They, those cows are waiting. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <laughs> Everything we sell in our restaurant, we make. Fresh every day. All our sauces. Uh, 
up to potato salad is my mother's recipe. We still make make it just like she made it. Uh, we, cook, we cook our own rice. All our sauces are made there. All the cold sauce is made there. Every product we sell, we make. Other than something like you know ketchup or something like that, but but anything that's got to do with the food is made fresh every day. And people say, well, how do you know how much to cook? I gamble a lot. We, we look at the records from last year and we try to see what last year did and we, you know, we try to cook the same amount, a little more, a little less, depending upon, you know, what it feels like. The one advantage we have is our food is ready. I can put a plate on your table quicker than you can go to McDonald's and get a hamburger because everything's ready. You don't have to wait. The staff's ready and they jump, jump right on it, which is great. The downside of that is if we have bad weather or something like that, then I don't sell the product. When you go and quote a normal restaurant, it's cooked to order. They cook it for you when you get there. You know, unless you go to a buffet or something. They say, well, what do you do with the food you have left over? I give it to the churches. They use it in their food banks. Uh, like uh, Broad Street Ministry, we give to them. We got several of those uh, uh, places that we give to, to, to help them. And we never miss it. The good Lord blesses us, so it's... It, I never miss that, never miss that. Well, even on Saturday night, if we have food left, then we give it away on Monday or Tuesday when, when the people come out there and pick it up. So that way we, we are always able to give the public fresh. And there's nothing wrong with what, what I'm saying is left over. It's refrigerated and everything, and it's just as good. And a lot of restaurants would resell that. I don't do that. I, I give you, I think if you're going to pay for fresh food, you ought to eat fresh food. And, and it's worked for us, so we're going to continue to do it that way. Because we love what we do. And it's, it's, there again, it's a passion for us. It's not, it's not a job. I tell people all the time, I don't ever go to work. I go have fun every day because I love what I do. You know, that, that's it. And that's the way my staff is. They say that, um, they say that you know, you're, you better find a job that you like a lot because it's what you do most of your life. Absolutely, absolutely. If you hate your job, this going to be a miserable life. Absolutely, absolutely. And I love the public. I mean, I, you know, they never cease to amaze me. That little time I was, uh, well, yeah, I was mayor of Augusta for a while, and then, then I was on the council. Actually, I was the last chairman of the old county commission and the first mayor of the new consolidated government. So that was kind of a neat, neat thing to do. And, and, and it was tough. It was, I had to do leave my business for a while, but the good Lord took care of it for me, and we went right back, and I had a staff that never missed a beat. I mean, they were right on top of it, so that's what it's all about. Uh, and, that, and that was one of the things I was going to ask you a little bit about, too, is about being mayor and about the trials and tribulations and what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. Did you, did you feel comfortable talking about that? Yeah, absolutely, sure. I, I guess one thing that, that uh, always amazed me about public service or politics, whatever you want to call it. In the private sector, like we are in the barbecue business, we make a decision, we implement it, we move on. In the public sector, you make a decision, then they got to study it a little bit, then they got to come back and get a consultant to check it out, and it's a miracle if it ever gets completed. I mean, I, I know y'all go through that and see the same thing I see, and it gets very frustrating because in the private sector, you want to go ahead and, and you want to move on to the next project after that project, you know, and just, just get, them, get them going. But I tell you, uh, uh, Augusta is so blessed, that last trans transportation tax really, really has helped us. I was looking at the, what is it, 1736, the magazine. We got all kind of good things that can happen to Augusta. I'm telling you, Augusta is on the verge of really booming, isn't it? And I'm proud to be a small part of that, just a small part. How are we doing now? You've done, you've, you've gotten close to 30 minutes. Yeah, I do while. have one question. I don't know if yeah. it's even necessary. Um, but succotash, is that what it's called? Hey, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that as somebody huh. from Louisiana. All right. Which is still Southern. But right, right, right. I've never heard of it until moving to Georgia. Right. So if you could explain. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's lots of different kinds of hash. There's corned beef hash, and everybody eats corned beef hash. 
And then there's Brunswick stew, which is made out of pork, beef, and chicken, I believe, and got vegetables in it. And then in our particular restaurant, we have hash. And I asked my daddy one time, I said, Daddy, why do we have hash? He said, son, if I want vegetables, we'll have soup. If I want hash, which is all meat, and we're going to have hash. And that's what he explained. Hash is made out like this. We make our hash out of pork, uh, you know, Boston butts, ham hocks, that we cut off the hams that we cook. Uh, let's see. Boston butts, ham hocks, beef chuck, and turkey breast. And that's the meat that goes in it. Then we put a little potatoes, a little onions, just for flavor. Then we use tomato paste for color. And that's what it's made out of. It takes eight hours to make a pot of hash. That's from, I mean, that's if we rush it and never stop. But they are giving, we, we do hours and let it simmer for a long time. But we start, you know, like the hash for, let's see, this is Wednesday afternoon about 3 o'clock, I think, it'll take a little bit. Our meat is already on for tomorrow, our hash is already on for tomorrow. It'll just simmer slow all night long. Then the cooks will come in about 4 o'clock in the morning. They'll start putting it together. They'll, uh, they'll dip up the, the meat out of the hash pot. They'll strain that, put the broth back in the hash pot, put the potatoes, onions, and tomatoes in the, uh, in the tomato paste in the hash pot, boil that. And while that's boiling, they'll go back and bone it out, um, and, you know, get everything ready, chop it up, or, or run it through a grinder, grind it up. Then when the potatoes and onions get ready, they'll bring the meat in, put it back in the pot, and boil it again. It's cooked three times. And it, it's a... Uh, when we first started in business, we made a hog head hash. And that's when they actually used a hog head. But we don't do that anymore. We, we make it out of, out of uh, better cuts for meat. But I mean, that's the way it was done back then. And uh, uh, I think I started earlier about my father and his hobby. He used to, we had our, raise our own pigs. So every 4th of July Labor Day, which is big barbecue days around here, he would have his bankers and, and his uh, attorney and his doctors, and he'd, he'd invite them all out to the farm, but they'd dig a pit in the ground and actually cook it out in the backyard. And of course, they'd, have a, they'd play poker, have a few drinks, do whatever the old folks did back then, you know. And that was just a, it was a, just a, a big celebration. And when my daddy came to Augusta in 56, there was only, I think, three other, quote, real barbecue places. It was a shorty down on East Boundary, there was uh, uh, Mr. Powell down on uh, Old Savannah Road. Uh, then you had Coach Goat Harris, Pig and Whistle, uh, the Red Pig, several others, but they weren't really barbecue places. They were more like drive-ins. But it was just those three, and that's basically how it got started. And somebody said, well, why do you only open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? We used to be open five days a week. We condensed it when we moved from, uh, in 70, in 88, from the bottom to where we are located today. We were open five days a week down there. Moved up on top of the hill, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something, I'm gonna gamble. We always did 75% of our business Friday and Saturday, 25% the other three days. So we said, let's compress it in the three days and see what happens. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, now we do 25% on Thursday, to 75% on Friday and Saturday. Same business, three days. Plus, we created a demand for it. You can't get it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So by Thursday, you know, you're ready to get a little barbecue. So that was just a, just a, something that we were, it happened by chance, not really, we didn't know it would work, but it worked and worked really, really good for us. So that's how we were able to, able to do that. And our family has just been blessed, I mean, so many ways, little things like that. And I was thinking the other day, you know, everybody's got to be six foot apart in this, in this uh, society we're living in right now. We built this bridge out there over, coming from the barbecue, from the parking lot into the barbecue place. Those columns are exactly, well, they're about six and a half foot apart. So we don't have to put anything on the floor, just stand by the column. You know, so it's, it's, it's like the good Lord said, Larry, I'm going to put this there for you because you're going to need it one day. It's saying it's worked. It's worked perfectly. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm a blessed young man. Got a great family, great employees, live in a great city. I mean, we just got the best of everything, really. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Did, that was great. How did we do? You did excellent. Good. Yeah, that's perfect. You knocked it out of the park. <laughs> I'm going to 
going to stop this one. If you're done, I didn't want to stop with you. you no, you tell me. I mean, do we need some more? Y'all okay? I'm good. I think yeah. we're good. Yeah. I mean, really good. I I, um, I did a film years ago um, about the people that used to live in Ellington. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Ellington oh, yes, yes. The bomb plant came. Right, right. And they talked about the, that was a tradition. It was like, I think once a month they would have a big cookout, and they, they would say in the morning you'd wake up to the smell of the, the pig. Right, pig. right. That's and exactly they right. Like at four in the morning, yeah. or three, they started cooking out there. And then all the ladies would cook the potatoes, make potato salad, and all the stuff would go with it. That's right. And they'd have this big feast in the later in the day. Right, and right. That was the country living. Tradition, right. And I, I didn't finish saying that while ago. I guess I forgot about that. But the reason we also do Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, years ago, the only time you could get barbecue was on Friday or Saturday at some kind of function. One of those are a political function. That was it. You just didn't find barbecue any other time because it wasn't something. Because it takes so long to cook, it's not something you know people just jump out there and do. Uh, but as a young man, I used to ride around my daddy. He would go and cook for people, and we would go all over the country and cook. He, I remember one time we went to Walterboro, South Carolina. They were introducing a new tractor, and we went over there and cooked barbecue for them for that tractor show. And you know, that's good Lord. I was, I was a little fellow back then. Uh, that's just. Well, that's that rural, that rural life. I mean, you know, I mean, um, back in those days, like you say, you, you probably started before sunrise because it's going to get hot as Hades outside. Absolutely. You've got to get out there and start working yeah. early. And, you know, um, and I interviewed a lot of people, and they said sometimes in the middle of the day, they take a break. Take a break, yes, right. Take a break and come in and stay out of it and then go back out later a lot of times, you know. Um, but it's hard work. You know, I was thinking about something else. And I was a young man going to school. You know, we always had, because they have them now, that's, everywhere got that, the little ham biscuits and the sausage biscuits. That's what Mama made us take to school. I, I, I always told Mama, I said, Mama, I want me a bologna sandwich. I don't want this ham. They didn't realize what we had something better. You know, because the other kids had bologna sandwiches, we had ham. You know, but everything that, that they ate, they grew right there. You know, we were right. They had, we had a smokehouse and had all that the sausage and the hams and all that stuff in the smokehouse. And it just, it was just a wonderful time. It really was. You slept good. There was no, there was probably no uh, uh, issues with insomnia growing up. Oh, no, farm. sir. No, sir. No. <laughs> 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 they raised them wonders at night and that cool air coming through there. Good gracious. Yeah, like a lamb. Mm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I interviewed a man the other day that he worked up, he was in, from North Carolina and he, he was the back he says, boy, he remembered the mule pulling the plow, you know, and doing that. I'm going, good Lord. You want to talk about hard work. Right, right. I, I worked on a farm when I was growing up, and we had an electric milker, and thank God for the electric milker. Oh, yes, sir. I remember one time, one of the worst spankings that I've got, they had, had me out there weeding cotton with a weeder. And, yeah, I was just a little old guy, and, oh, God, my little legs got tired, so I decided I was going to jump up on the weeder. Well, I started pulling the cotton up. And he come up just about the time I got on that weed. I hadn't gone too, I didn't tap too much. He got through with me, I wasn't able to sit on, I should have went up and sat on a mule, I could have done that, you know. <laughs> but just didn't think, you know, it was just so easy to jump up on that weeder. Uh, uh, Absolutely, then. I might as well get on that, it'll make life a little easier. Yeah, that's right, there you go, there you go. Well, it was an innocent thought, you didn't know. You no, know, didn't, didn't think about pulling up the cotton. Good gracious, I wouldn't have done that. Another time he sent me out, to, me and one of my, my little farm buddies, to plant some pine trees. And we, you know, with the, with the little devil, if you know what I'm talking about. I don't know, he must have gave us a thousand pine trees. So we got it, we planted, we planted, we planted. So I said, man, look here, we ain't gonna never get through. Let's, let's start putting two or three in there. You know, so, and then it got to where we were putting a bunch of them. Well, every time I got caught, it was because I just would start something, so he'd catch me. Oh boy, he he tan my jacket a little bit, you know, and make me appreciate the life. And and uh, I learned, I learned. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, we had we used to have to do that too. We planted pine trees all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Take that thing in the ground, you make the hole, you drop yep. it in there, then you take another one, push, push it, it forward. That's right. Yes, sir. That's yes, a sir. Long day doing that. I can tell you, good gracious. And now you know everything's automated. It's yeah, just, it's amazing. I think it's cool, your story, I, I, you know, just, you know, it's 
say you 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 took you went from what you learned on the farm and taking that your dad did yep. and taking that into a business and it was a business on the farm but you took it into a bigger you all took it into a much bigger situation. absolutely absolutely well that's what I said what I tell people all the time if you look at our restaurant to me that's a monument to my mother and father you know I wanted to build something for them I wish they could walk back and just see what we took that little hole in the wall and did for them you know because. They gave me, I often think they were the quarterback, and they handed me the ball and said, run with it. You know, either make it or, or fail. And I, I couldn't, I just couldn't fail. I couldn't do that. That fail was not not a word I could handle back then. They had to do it and do it right. So. You certainly didn't fail. You no, sir, I've been, well. I've been very <laughs> blessed. We've been very blessed. Yeah, it's well known, established, like you say, feeding the presidents. That's pretty impressive. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I was looking through some old pictures the other day. Do y'all remember Gary Hart? He ran for president and he got in some kind of scandal and had a boat named Monkey Business or something like that. I found those pictures the other day and I was looking through some of my stuff out there. Sure well, did. Well, Bill Kirby, Bill Kirby um, had some pictures of the White House with barbecue. Right, he sure did. Yeah, and, uh, and it was during the Carter administration. That's right, that's and right. It was the barbecue. It was. Yeah. It was, that was a, uh, President Carter had, the, this is the first time any sitting president had ever had the Democrats and the Republicans together at the White House at the same time. So sure, that was June the 14th, 1980. Oh, wow. Sure was, yeah, that, that was really neat. Yeah, I should dig up those pictures. He had those, because he was there. He was, he sure was, yes. And he was eating barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a good, he said he had a good time. He showed me the pictures, he still got the pictures. Is that right? God, I tell you, we, we were, I drove my truck up there, and we had all the equipment and everything, and we flew the barbecue up. So, of course, they come out and checked everything. And, and Anyway, when I got up there and drove into the White House compound, the uh, Secret mm -hmm. Service met me, and they said, now, we got to go through your truck uh, to make sure there's nothing in your truck. So, okay, fine. I, you know, I've been with this truck ever since I left Augusta, Georgia, never, never out of my eyesight. Well, we went around to the back of the truck. Unbeknownst to me, they were at the front of the truck putting a bomb under the front of the truck. They actually put the C T C four, whatever it is, up on the front of the truck. So, <laughs> so they got the dogs all up in the back of the truck, and everything was fine. And then the guy walked around to the front of the truck and the dog sat down. And he slapped me on the back, about scared me to death. He said, Boy, you in trouble. I said, well, what do you mean I'm in trouble? He said, There's a bomb on your truck. I said, well, Ain't no bomb on that truck. I said, That dog ain't done all that scratching like they do on TV. He said, That's for TV. He said, a real bomb dog doesn't do that. They said, ow. That's what that dog did. He went up there and pulled that bomb off one and show, showed me. He said, we want to make sure, and they had two other dogs over there. He said, we want to make sure that if the dog got up in your truck and got those uh, odors of barbecue, that it wouldn't affect his smelling that bomb out. So say, they scared old Larry good, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, my God. Probably lost two years of my life right quick. Hey, that, that was a great experience, what it really was. That's a cool story, because, yeah, um, you, they were all out on the lawn in the front of the White House. You see the White House yeah. back behind them, right out in the front there, the tables they brought up and set up. When I was a mayor, the, uh, uh, we were at the airport meeting uh, President Clinton when he came. You know, I think he was, he was come to Augusta State back then to do some kind of scholarship for America similar to the Hope Scholarship. Do you remember when he did that? Mm -hmm. I think it was in, in 97. Yeah, we had just barely got here. We moved here in 95, yeah. so yeah. Anyway, we, we were out there in one of those little rooms at the airport and the and the Secret Service were running around there and one of his phones started ringing. He went away in the corner and he kind of looked over at me and he walked over at me and he said, do you own a barbecue place? I said, yes, I sure do. He said, I got Air Force One on the phone. They want some barbecue. I said, I got you covered, not a problem. So, you know, so that's some fun things that we've done, yeah. That's that was really neat, that was really neat. Yeah. I love that. Yes, that's sir. Really cool. Air Force One ate your Yes, ate. <laughs> yes, sir, we, we put it on there. Well, I was going to say, your parents would be very proud. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Not yeah, many yeah. restaurants can say that they've had presidents no, eat sir. their food. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we were, we were actually going to feed uh, President um, Reagan, when he was here in Augusta, when Charlie Harris ran through the gates at Augusta National, we were to feed him that night. Because, you know, they made him leave. They took them all out of here. 
But that was kind of, that was, that was, that was neat. We've had some good experiences. We really have. Yes, well, I'm sir. glad you're coming out on the other side with this pandemic and okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. This really hit a lot of businesses. Yeah. Uh, you know, I worry about all the little places on Broad Street that were just getting going good. Yeah. I hope they're going to make it, man. Oh, just terrible. I was watching a, uh, one of the news shows this morning, and uh, a lot of the people, you know, they had put their life savings into businesses, and then, you know, gosh, what's going to happen to them? You know, I don't know. I, no income coming in. It's no, tough. sir. No, sir. I mean, all those people that work for them. Exactly. And, you know, most of the places don't own their building. Most of them lease the buildings and things. I mean, you know, there again, not bragging, but I'm just blessed. It, our building, we, we own our building, didn't have old. There's so many things that, they, that we've been blessed with that the average you know, person just doesn't have. But I guess knocking it out for 64 years makes that difference, you know. You're established and you've, yes, got, sir. you've got the structure in place and everything you need. But these, like you say, the new businesses... I hate it because there's a lot of new ones that were coming Oh, I do down too. Down, and it's like, you, this, you can't do that. You know, that's no. the wipes them out. Absolutely, absolutely. You borrow all that money to set up and redo and. And you know, even some of your big chains are going out. I've been, I get our rustic magazines and I get it online daily and it's amazing how many of those big ones are going out now. You know, and you look at movie theaters and like the Imperial and the Miller and these places downtown here and it's like, are they going to, you know, this is I know, really scary. I know. I don't know. When can they open back up and it's safe for people to sit next to Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Did, you. did we get good? Y'all yeah, exactly. pleased yeah. with everything? Maybe some extra stuff there at the yeah. end. <laughs> All right, all right, good, good, okay.